what can travel retailers learn from disruptors? Disruptors, I assume you mean disruptors in retail? Of course. Disruptors in consumer-facing brands. I think what we can see from the disruptors, the ones that are ahead of the curve, have hun understood fundamentally that retail is polarizing. They, on the one hand, have got to deliver hyper-convenient, zero-touch, frictionless experiences. And on the other hand, they've got to deliver immersive um, experiences around uh, their brand, around storytelling. I think disruptors are ones, brands that experiment quickly, fail quickly, uh, test. Uh, disruptors are absolutely customer obsessed. Um, everything they do is driven and is centered around the customer. Um, the, brand, uh, <clears throat> the clients that we work with that are disruptors, when we visit their offices, when we, we do workshops, they talk about their customer as though they're in the room. They refer to them as a name, as a person. They're omnipresent in their day-to-day -day life. They know intricately in a granular way what kind of lives their customers lead. Disruptors don't just do you know, um, conventional research. They go deep dive ethnography. They get into the lives of the customer, not just uh, how the customer buys their product. Uh, I think that they are you know, big differences. And the people in the disruptor businesses don't just understand their brand, don't just love their brand, they live their brand. They live it, they understand, as I say, what role it plays in their customers' lives beyond just selling them stuff. I think they are you know, very, very key Issues. I think some more and more disruptors are what we call social first businesses. Social is it drives everything. I mean, look at Gymshark, um, recently acquired, um, only after seven or eight years, as, as, as an amazing valuation. Um, and they do all their marketing through, through social platforms and, and, and influencers. So I think that's, that's really, really interesting. You know, brands like Showfields have really demonstrated how you can bring real theatre to retail and really um, redefining what a department store should be. Um, of course, you know, Amazon, Amazon with Amazon Go and Wheelies uh, in China, how they have really kind of uh, understood and, and brought to the fore uh, autonomous shopping, hyper convenient, frictionless shopping. Um, uh, look at Volvo, what Volvo are doing, a, a, a traditional brand, uh, a legacy car, uh, a brand, but really pioneering now, uh, creating uh, uh, collaborations um, with logistics companies, whereby when their when their cars are can be controlled by an app, you'll be able to open the boot of your car remotely to accept shopping um, um, uh, that's delivered to your car whilst you're not there. So if you know if you're a, if you're a real estate owner and you have hundreds of car parking spaces, then you know that's an opportunity for a service proposition. Um, uh, look at Peloton, how they've created a truly connected uh, subscription economy um, uh, uh, service uh, that, is, that is part of uh, creating a community around their exercise bikes, um, which is you know, really, really interesting. Uh, I can go on and on. Rafa, again, creating real communities. Patagonia, driving their, their, um, uh, uh, driving their brand through, through their purpose more than anything else, to a point where they've really cottoned on to the cultural shift and the cultural phenomenon of abstinence, where consumers are, are wanting to switch off from brands. And that's gonna be a very, very key uh, cultural kind of phenomenon that we've got to really kind of keep an eye on, where, where people wanna detox, brand detox, enough communication, and Patagonia are saying, do not buy our coat, <laughs> you know, repair your old one. That's really interesting how that communication um, is happening. And it's, it's all around the cultural shift of the zero movement. Um, very interesting. So what solutions have you seen from these disruptors that could be applied right now to travel retailers? I think um, certainly the, 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 the Showfields model, this amazing theatrical, um, experiential space that um, some of it is transactional, but a lot of it is, is populated by brands, many of whom are, are um, online brands, that they're, they're there to create uh, recruiting, recruitment of customers and um, 
to drive to drive them onto their uh, e-commerce sites or, or social platforms. So I think creating a, a, an amazingly engaging, enriching experience like Showfields uh, is a is a is a is a really interesting kind of uh, uh, example and, ben- and 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 benchmark. I think something like some, a food offer like Vita Mojo. Vita Mojo is a disruptor. It, it's hyper personalized food. It's all based on an app that you can personalize every single meal you have. You choose each ingredient and each ingredient as you choose it, as you select it for your meal, gives you nutritional information about that one ingredient. Um, and then adds up all the nutritional um, information about about your meal. Um, and the next step with them is to create that personalization at a DNA level. So from your DNA. So the you know, disruptors are understanding uh, uh, really about hyper personalization, even to a DNA level. Um, so these are, I think, are very interesting, particularly as the, uh, you know, as post, post-COVID, the explosion in consumers about the priority of wellness, where wellness in the world of brands, in the world of retail, ceases to become, ceases to be uh, a category. Wellness is no longer a category. Wellness should run through the bloodstream, through the DNA of all businesses. We've got, we've got to, as businesses, have a wellness strategy like we have a sustainability strategy. I think that's, that's really critical. Um, in terms of other, other aspects of the disruptors can be applied to travel retail, definitely autonomous shopping with Amazon Go and, and Wheelies and others. I think um, we're, we're seeing... Uh, um, uh, a growth of robotic uh, 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 service offers, um, robotic c- coffee makers. I've just saw literally the other day, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I posted it yesterday, uh, uh, a robotic pizza maker. Um, so these automated offers with, combined with 3D printing, I think are gonna create hyper convenient F&B and retail, and that is absolutely applicable to, 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 to airports. I think things like uh, brands like Gentle Monster, um, who are an eyewear brand? They present their eyewear in in, in almost a in, in almost a gallery in like a, a whole series of installations, uh, really immersive. Uh, and and the act transaction mostly happens online. Warby Parker, who started as an online brand, uh, moved physically offline, but their their model is online. Um, look at the Guardian. The Guardian is a newspaper opening coffee shops where they have a resident a journalist who's writing about the location, about the area. Why shouldn't airports, and I know this has happened, uh, but have you know, resident writers, resident poets that talk about that, 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 that very abused term, sense of place. Let's make it real. Let's bring well, it. Heathrow did that quite recently. They did. They did. No, no and, and others have. But I think we can make more of that. I think that's really, really interesting. And story in New York. You know, story is a store. It completely changes every month. A new theme. Everything gets ripped out, and it changes every month. It's more like an exhibition. Mm. Uh, really interesting. So these are all all disrupt disruptors and. Um, and, and I would uh, also, I cite like a media entertainment brand, Ghostbusters um, created a, 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 an experience at Waterloo Station actually, which was a really, really kind of immersive disruption in the, in the, in the concourse, linked to, to um, media in, on the it screens. JC Deco above, wasn't JC it? JC Deco, yeah. yeah. So, so those kind of, um, kind of experiences, those kind of um, interventions are really, really interesting. I want to sort of shift gear a second, uh, and I know that there is a potential new business model for airports that actually involves airlines. Uh, do you want to care to share that? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this, and, um, and this is kind of me and my colleagues kind of uh, exploring possibilities over a beer or two, and we're thinking, okay, so as 5G takes hold, as internet in flight becomes faster. Um, more importantly, as e-commerce in uh, websites for brands become more immersive, more gamified, more experiential, and less just transactional, which is what's going to happen to websites, particularly as gamification uh, really takes hold. It's going to be really entertaining. Um, uh, 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 being on, 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 on an e-commerce site for a brand. And as airlines um, can offer that in flight, I can see many customers shopping in flight. 
whilst you know immersing themselves in brand. So let's take that one step further. And this is this is us speculating um, and maybe provoking. So what happens then if a, a customer shops online in flight um, and uh, where does that leave the brand experience? If I'm buying a bottle of Johnny Walker in flight and picking it up at my arrival airport or my destination hotel or back home, my journey and my experience with Johnny Walker may well start in the airport and the transaction may well then happen on flight. Does that lead to a relationship between the airline and the brand? The relationship that currently the duty-free operator has. Does that, does that change the dynamic? Does that have any impact? What happens when maybe a lot of pre-planned functional shopping migrates in flight? Where does that leave the travel retail, the duty-free operator? If I know, you know, I don't need to see a, a, a Toblerone um, on a shelf or a lead label Smirnoff on a shelf. I know I buy that all the time. Why would I? Why would I? Why, why wouldn't I buy it in flight? Uh, and where does that leave the relationship between the airline and logistics businesses in order to, to, to do the logistics? Are we going to see an Amazon fly? Are we going to see Uber fly? Are we going to see airlines create relationships with those logistics companies, but also have a conversation with airports to say, actually... Have a location. Have a location. Does the airline begin to change it, you know, in its relationship with its customers, its offer, and does that affect the relationship the airline has with the brands? And what impact does that have on the physical space? Does the airline take the physical space and sublease to the... Um, uh, uh, brand. Maybe that's fanciful. Maybe that's a step too far. But I'm uh, partly I, I, my, um, I'm here kind of as my colleagues are to provoke a little bit, to provoke a conversation. And what I do know, and this is not a provocation, what I do know is that we are staring at serious disruption in the airport space. And it's our job at Portland to speculate, to to provoke, and to paint a picture that is that, that we in the industry, and we count ourselves as part of the industry, we've been in this industry for over 30 years. I personally have worked in airports and airport clients for 30 years. And, and we see ourselves, not as in the design industry, we, are see, we see ourselves as in the airport industry. Uh, we're in this community and we share all the challenges and the pains and the opportunities. And we think it's absolutely right that we, 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 we tell these stories and we, we try to paint a picture to see what, what the possibilities are, because we love the industry. The airline renaissance is an interesting uh, proposition, uh, but it is doable. It, I mean, it's doable, especially if there is a sense of collaboration, new sense of collaboration between the respective stakeholders. The problem is that, how realistic is that? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I think the, the in-flight e-commerce is very doable, and I think it's obvious. The impact on the airport terminal is, is more kind of grey. From what I was saying about the online uh, in-flight um, commerce, it will be interesting how then the airlines treat the gate lounges. What do they become? You know, do, they, do they become sponsored? Are they, are they more branded environments? Of course, there's the issue of not, want, not wanting to drive traffic from the IDL into the gate lounges. You know, th th there's that. But uh, I think that's, that's the current paradigm. We're talking about a new paradigm. You know, where, whereby uh, you know this, the, the whole um, the whole valuation of of customer engagement isn't just footfall, um, and and I, I never believed in really a walkthrough store. I think it should be an engaged through store. Uh, a lot of customers I see walking through or more running through a walkthrough store are rarely engaged, um, and and I think how do we measure engagement, whatever form that might take? I think that's key. So yeah, so. What impact is it going to have on the terminal? We're interested, of course, what we, our job and our expertise is, how does it impact the design of the terminal? How is it going to impact our master planning in terms of commercial master planning for airports? How is it going to impact our design of the retail areas, the retail guidelines? Well, they're, they're all changing. We really believe architecturally there's going to be a big, big shift. There has to be a big shift.
The architecture, with, the architecture needs to be reimagined completely yes. to cater yeah. for the new new. Yeah, and to cater for new uses, new experiences, new occupiers. And this is exactly what we're doing in where most of our work is at the moment. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of work in airports right at this, right at this moment with, with COVID. We have a few projects, but where most of our work is at the moment is repurposing shopping centres. And I don't mean redesigning them, repurposing them, reconfiguring them, you know, and bringing in, bringing in co-working, bringing in nurseries, bringing in uh, medical and, and health care and wellness, um, connecting residential to offices. We're seeing more and more brands take up residential space, residential, um, um, occupying residential space to, to allow their customers to live their brand. You know, so really big changes in, in shopping centres. Um, and, and we can bring that learning definitely to the airport sector. So what other uses are you looking for uh, from shopping centres? Um, yeah, another thing we're doing, which is actually current project, is, 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 is looking at um, plugging in hotels into uh, uh, um, vacant department store um, spaces. But this isn't just about putting in a hotel because we want to just fill up a vacant space. This is about rethinking hotels, rethinking the lobby, how it connects to the shopping centre and what impact that has to the, to, the, to, the, to the experience. How does it create a synergy between the retail and the F&B and co-working? So we're looking for hotel brands that really, really deliver that and how we integrate it architecturally. And of course, once you do that, it will change the, change the centre of gravity of a shopping centre. It will shift the emphasis to where potentially the hotel is. And the same with co-working. So, uh, yeah, so we're not just plugging in different uses as a real estate play. This is about rethinking the impact it might have uh, and rethinking the, the, the mix and the experience. And the other thing we're doing, which I think is really applicable to airports, is in shopping centres, we're creating a, a commercial master plan and a, and a, and a strategy which combines in, and creates synergy between small independents and large national and international brands. How can we bring those together? How can, we, how can they work close, close uh, together? How do they work in synergy? Because that's what customers are looking for. But of course, if you take that from a leasing model, that changes the game. You've got to have flexible leasing. And as we've said in the previous, in the previous sessions, you know, companies like Hammerson and LNG are really reinventing uh, the re leasing models um, into really flexible models. And we can learn from that definitely in the airport industry. But it takes a quantum leap for architects, doesn't it, to completely rethink the design of airports to accommodate what's required nowadays. I mean, there aren't going to be that many new airport builds, possibly with the exception of China, um, uh, in, the in the next 10 years. But certainly, there needs to be a cultural shift there too. And, that, and they have to be briefed in turn by the airport, the airport authorities, to say, we need something different that marries up better with what's out there. Yeah. And I think uh, India will see airports growing as well. Um, You've touched on a, 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 a raw nerve with me. Um, I've been in too many workshops and too many meetings that discuss design of new airports or new terminals, where none of the talk is about customers and brands and shopping and experience, and all the talk is about what, what shape the roof should be or where the column should be. Well, I guess uh, it's also all about, am I going to win an award or not as well, aren't, isn't it? Yeah. and. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe with some, I don't know. Um, I think what we've got to do in airports is that we've got to absolutely deliver the aviation planning and the commercial planning, the aviation strategy and the commercial strategy together. They have to be in sync. Simultaneously, be in simultaneously sync. and defining the story, defining the place, defining the, ex the experience as a proposition for an airport. That storytelling must drive everything. That narrative must drive everything and it must drive the brief to the architects. And I think that is, that's got to be the future if we're going to rethink um, the commercial offer in airports. So how are the architects going to react with um, the new requirements that may be imposed upon them from airports? I think architects in airports um, have definitely got to adapt to understand um, what are the cultural drivers that impact passengers and consumers 
uh, and their behaviour and what they expect from airports. I think that's where we've got to start. We've got to start with culture. What are the trends that drive culture and how that impacts customers' relationship with brands and places? We've got to then, from that culture, understand the people themselves. How do they behave? What are their, what are their behavioural kind of traits and how that's going to change? And what are their missions? What are their journeys? And then we've got to, um, from that, create the narrative, the story, uh, the proposition uh, uh, of, of that experience. And only then should we start thinking about planning and buildings and, 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 uh, and the like. I think, like all retail, it's got to start from culture. You've got to understand that. And that's the way to, I think, ensure we future-proof our airports. And with COVID, we've got a future-proof fast.